joining us uh, today from a distance at, at home or wherever you're at. Uh, know that we love you, we care for you, and we look forward to being able to uh, be in your presence again and be able to uh, love on you and fellowship and, and all the things that we're called to do as, as the church. And I just want to let you know we, we love you all and we miss you. And so uh, we'll probably actually get to, to beam in the, the Wilkinson sisters again next Sunday. So I, uh, that, what a blessing, right? What a blessing to know that even though they're, yeah. Even though they're away and they're dealing with things, they're like, we're, we can just stay home and like watch, I don't know what's on Sunday mornings. I didn't, I, Dr. Phil, I don't know, whatever. Uh, but but they have said we love the Lord and we love our church family so much. It's a privilege for us to to be able to do this even at a distance. And so it's just been wonderful to uh, be able to be a part of people that love the body of Christ that much. Like even though we're not there, we're there. Amen. Thank you for some of your stories over this past week. Uh, I've gotten a chance to talk to some of you and. And, and there's been some like wonderful things that people have fronted Christ in before they encountered something terrible. And I, I watched like a bunch of you be like, wow, that wasn't pleasant, but it's okay. Like a lot of you knew, know that uh, Mr. Dave Holman's store got broken into the other day. And thousands of dollars worth of damage and the guy took stuff and and uh, you know they got him and everything, but I'm like, oh man, if I was in Dave's position right now, what would I do? <laughs> but I'd be like mad. I'm like, this guy needs justice. You know how how dare somebody break in and 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 do what they did here and damage things and take things that aren't theirs and and, and I, I saw the response and some of you did as well online where Dave and Julie are like, yeah, this is what happened. Uh, this is the young man's name. Can you guys pray for him that he would come to know Christ? <laughs> uh, that's not what the flesh does. And so it's so good to see the Spirit of God coming out of people and saying, I, 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 know, I know that this is a trial, I know this is difficult, but this is an opportunity for me to be Christ-like in this moment. And so you know, keep bringing those stories. Those, those things are just great to hear. And there's, and that one was kind of a public one. That's why I shared that one. But there was a bunch of other uh, conversations this week that were uh, you just wow. You know, the spirit is is freeing people up in life so that they can live a holy life, and in that they can then glorify God with all that they're doing. Is that your desire today? Is your is the desire of your heart? That you would glorify the Lord in everything that you're doing. Tall order, yes? Yes? Everything. God, God wants me to respond out of the depth of the change that he's wrought in me. And you too. Amen? So what does that look like? And particularly... You know, to his glory, we want to do these things. In particular, to where we find ourselves right now in a very strange time in the world and a very strange time in our culture, right? Because when you look out or you open a newspaper, that's a real thing, right? Opening an actual newspaper. No, Cindy. Um, you, you know, you open the newspaper or you, you, you turn on the TV or you open your laptop or you open up your your tablet or smartphone, and, and what is it that you are greeted by? <laughs> Dave doesn't ask any rhetorical questions. So, ne negativity, negative news, ne okay. Oh, what does it say there? Drought. Oh, well, that's not too bad, I guess. So. <laughs> the, the, the wages of sin, okay. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you just look, and, and there's no wonder why so many people are feeling so downtrodden in life right now. Because when they look out, and you don't have to look very far, and in fact, you weren't looking very far, not too many months ago, because you were confined, 
right? Which is what everybody wants to experience in life, right? Like it's interesting, like when when our our system of uh, law and justice and order, when we want to punish people, what do we do? We put them in a very small confined space, and a lot. That's where a lot of us were not too long ago. And like, what is what is the positive part about that? And you look out, and there's there, there, there's conflict, and there's people that are pointing fingers at this person group, and then that person group is pointing at this person group, and then these people over here are pointing that way, and and you start saying, oh man, this is chaotic. This is difficult to even look at, let alone try to comprehend that. And when we're in the middle of that, if you are a Christian, what is it that you are to be looking for? Where are we looking to be able to understand our hope and our meaning and our purpose? Yeah. Not a bad thing. Yeah. But in, in all these things, and this is where we're going to go this morning, um, our hope and our meaning and our purpose and our life is found because of the glory of God. We sang about that earlier today. We, we, we watched a short video clip about that. Uh, we've been walking through its new city catechism for kids. I know when you hear catechism, you get kind of, maybe some of you are like, Ugh. Um, but this is just another... Uh, thing that we're doing to disciple our children and it's questions and answers and the the fourth question is how and why did God create us how and why did God create us and the answer is that God created us male and female in his own image to know him love him live with him and glorify him and it is right that we who were created by God should live to his glory and the next question, question five in this catechism says, what else did God create? And it says, God created all things by his powerful word, and all his creation was very good. Everything flourished under his loving rule. When you look out there today, is that what you're seeing? Maybe I'd put it a different way. Is that what you are perceiving Extremely difficult to see, isn't it? This morning, I'd like to read out of Isaiah 43. And the context here is Isaiah is prophet to Israel, and he's, he's telling them about all of the different things that they will go through in life, all the struggles, and even kind of backtracks a little bit to talk about what they have already been through in the exodus and what they've been through as a people group. But he's giving them an opportunity for them to not get lost in the shuffle of things or get lost in the times in life where things are not going well. Anybody? But instead, he points us towards the reason and the answer for all things. Isaiah 43, 1 says this, But now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name, and you are mine. And when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. And when you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt for your ransom, Cush and Seba for your stead. And since you are precious and honored in my sight, and as I love you, I will give people in exchange for you, nations in exchange for your life. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bring your children from the east and gather you from the west. 
And I will say to the north, give them up. And to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. And everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Why is this all here? Why is any of this here? Why is there any, why is there any ground to stand on? You ever, you ever thought about the old, the old spark that you have in your head and in your life? Why does that exist? Why is there a starry sky at night when you look up? Why do flowers bloom? Why do trees know to actually drop their leaves in the fall and grow them back in the springtime? And the short answer for this is that this world is the way that it is. And the created order is what it is because that's the way that God not only created the world, but it's why he created the world for his own glory. Now, a lot of people have said, that sounds kind of selfish. It sounds kind of narcissistic. But what if you're perfect in your goodness? Can there be found any fault in that? That's like, you don't have to look too far to, to realize that. Like, I'm not good, therefore, it's easy to understand why I wouldn't be good all the time. That's why I could be narcissistic. I could be a, a jerk. I could act in such ways that show the character that has not been changed yet or has not been conformed to the image of Christ. But you look at God, and when he makes good things, it's because he himself is good. And when he does this, it's so that he can show his glory. Isaiah 43, 6 and 7, the second half of 6, going to 7, says, Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, who I created for my glory, whom I made, formed and made. And even if the, the narrowest meaning here is I brought as God brought Israel into being for his glory, the use of the words created and formed and made are all pointing back at us as part of the original act of creation. And that's why everything exists. That's why Israel ultimately exists, because this is why all things are the way that they are, and it's for the glory of God. God made that. He made you sitting here today so that he might be glorified. When the first chapter in God's word says this, it says, So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. What is the point of that? When you look at a tree, you're like, that's beautiful. When you look at the, the starry expanse above you, and, it's, and it literally looks like what God described it as like stretched out over you like a canvas. You're like, I can see that. I can look at that, and I can find the, the beauty in it. I can find where I don't really find a lot of fault with a tree. Do you? I don't look up in the sky at the stars and say, oh, I, I have a problem with you. Stars, I have a problem with you. But what about you? Why did he make you? This is a very good question, isn't it? Why did God choose to make us the way that he did it? What's the point? You are born, made, created in the image of of God. And the point of an image is to display the original, to point the original back, to glorify the original. 
Have you ever thought about that with your kids? Like you kind of procreated them? If you did, why? So that they could like cuss you out later on in life? So that they could like walk up and like kick you in the shins when they felt like it? Did you have kids so that those kids could, could do things that ultimately are disastrous to their own life and to everybody around them? And you start saying, well, I would never want somebody that kind of bears my likeness to do something like that to me. <laughs> it's not indifferent to God. We're, we, as his creation, are supposed to ultimately point back to him. God made us in his image so that we would be filled with the reflection of God, images of God. Think about this. How many people in the world right now? Roughly. Yeah, going on 8 billion. 8 billion images of God walking around in this world. Why do you think he does that? Why do you think he wants in the original call to humanity, be fruitful and multiply and fill this sucker up? Why? So you could be worried about like overpopulation and human trafficking and and global warming and viruses. Is, is that why are there eight billion people that bear the image of God walking around in this world right now? I read a quote that said, "So that nobody would miss the point of creation. So nobody, unless they were blind, could miss." The point of humanity, namely God knowing, loving, and showing us himself. Brother Dave's been camping in Isaiah lately. So I went back there and there's tons of wonderful, beautiful understandings of how God promotes who he is into the created order, into people's lives. We see in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3, there's angels crying out in front of God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. It's full of billions of human image bearers. Not only us, it's nature too. And and why such a, a beautiful, breathtaking world for us to live in? Why? Did you know you could fit all, all 8 billion people? It would be cramped, but you could fit them all in Jacksonville, Florida? The city, you know? You could fit with a certain amount of certain amount of space you could you could fit all of those billions of people in Jacksonville so why didn't God just create a Jacksonville and have us be there be tight and cozy and everything and make sure you have hygiene and everything because <laughs> you're be close but but why did God make what we see rather than what it should have maybe could have been for us just to kind of exist in and sustain in Why such a vast universe? There is stuff out there that you and I have no clue about, and we won't. You ever notice when people discover things that are further out, like when our technology for telescopes and stuff like that gets better, people are like, we think there's a planet orbiting a star 80 billion light years from here. <gasps> Why is that such a, an amazing thing? Why is it so vast? Why is it so intricate and ordered and beautiful? I, I read the other day 
that there are more stars in the universe than there are words and sounds that all humans of all time have ever spoken. Why are there that many stars? And did you know they all have names? Did you know that? The, the God in his word says that he has given them all names. He's named them all. Why? For his glory. <laughs> like, he even has an intimate tying into his creation to, to name every single star. Who would do that? Would you do that? Imagine you went to the, the beach today and you, and you, you said... All of the sand on this beach is maybe a close representation of maybe some of the known stars that we've seen, just what we've seen, and you can't know about stuff you haven't seen. And you went and you took each grain of sand and you gave it its own name and its own place to be. Huh. You'd be like, that's crazy. So why does God do it? For his glory. God created us to know him. Created us to, to love him and, and show him the love that we have for him. And the Bible says in Psalm 19, when the heavens declare the glories of God, and if someone asks if the earth is the only inhabited planet, man the only like kind of rational inhabitant among the stars, why such a large and seemingly vast and empty universe? Has anybody ever asked you that? Why do you do why do you do it like that? Anybody ever asked you that? I I've been asked that. You know what a good response is in that? Because it's not about you. <laughs> It's not about you. I heard the president say the other day they're gonna we're gonna plant the American flag on Mars. I'm like, that's you know, in, in units of space measurement, that's like nothing. And we're the, the that's one of the greatest achievements that we could possibly do is send something to a neighboring planetary body, and people are like, oh my goodness, ah. And it's, it is a feat. It's a feat, right? I've never been there. You ever been there? I don't plan on going there. There's nothing there. But the answer to why, like if, if everything that is concentrated in the universe in redemptive history is here, why do everything out there? You know why? Because it's not about you. It's about God. God created us. He created us so that we would we would know him. Not like know of him. Everybody you know, everybody knows there's a God out there. Everybody everybody knows. Everybody knows God is real. Some people will say I don't want him to be real. That's why I say that I don't believe in him. But if you look around, you, you can't say all oh, this just happened. It didn't. And even in our ignorance of how things were to come into existence, you would have to, at some point, even be in awe of it as an accident. How many people are in awe of an accident? God created us to know him and love him and, and to show him that we love him. And he gave us an idea of what he is kind of like in his abilities to be God, which we are not. And he says, okay, here's the known universe. Check it out. Just have a look around. And what do we always say? Whoa. That is amazing. Back after they launched Hubble Telescope into space, they've been looking in a bunch of different places in the heavens, and they would kind of try to focus in on different you know, points of light and, and places where light was originating from. And then they came across this place in, in the heavens that appeared just to be a black space. And they're like, I wonder, I wonder what's going on there. Because everywhere else you kind of see a bunch of stuff going on. So they, they, they turn Hubble that way and they focus for a couple days on this very dark, very black place in space, which would infer what? Nothing there. 
And have you ever seen the Hubble deep space view? When you get home today, Google that. <laughs> Look for the image of that. And you'll see all of these galaxies. And they said it's one of the most concentrated areas in space that the, we've, we've discovered with galaxies. And it's all of these things that are just out there spinning and beautiful and existing. And with the unaided eye, you can't see it. And people, I want you to look at them and be like, God is so awesome. Look at that. The universe is declaring the glory of God, and the reason we exist is to, to see it and, and, and be in awe of it and to, to show God the glory that he deserves because of it. So Paul says in Romans chapter 1, 20 through 21, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clear seen being understood from what has been made so that people are without an excuse for although they knew God they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him and the great tragedy of the universe is that, <laughs> that while human beings were made to glorify God we have all fallen short of this purpose and like in Romans 1.23, it says, Exchange the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man. And on a couple other things, bugs and created things and little things. But we have exchanged the glory of God for the immortal, of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man. You know what the primary example of that exchange is for all people? You look at it in the mirror every day. You look at your, your own image and you look at it divorced from God and you glory in that rather than in the God that has clearly made himself known and clearly showed his divine attributes and clearly shown his power and clearly shown his wisdom and his knowledge. And this is the essence of sin when we look in the mirror and say, no, I'm God. No, I'm God. How does that glorify God? So why did God create the universe? I don't know about you guys, but sometimes whenever I ask that question, I, I, I kind of try to pull it back to me and center it around myself. Do you ever do that? Man, you know, if God wouldn't have made anybody else but, but you, Dave, he would have made everything the way it is right now. Maybe that's true. I don't know. But it's a pretty arrogant place to live. Or you've maybe heard it said, if you were the only person out there and you sinned and, 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 and God needed to redeem you through Christ Jesus, if you were the only person that lived, Jesus would do that for you, and he very well may. But how arrogant and how selfish and how self-centered is it for me to want to draw that conclusion that I am that special and me alone that God would come and do all these things for me. And instead, God created the world for His glory, not ours. You ever look in the mirror and say, thank you, Lord. Thank you that I'm standing here breathing. Thank you that I'm, I woke up this morning. Thank you that I still have my, my heart beating in my chest. And my, there's a little bit of a spark up here. Sometimes it's duller. <laughs> and sometimes it snaps pretty good. Thank you for giving me life because that's where it comes from. And if that's true, God, how do I glorify you through it? And Isaiah states it pretty plainly in Isaiah 43 through 7 it's created for my glory. And Isaiah and the, the entire Bible and the creation 
compresses the reality over and over to help us understand and dare I say feel it and make it a fabric of our thinking that that everything that I come into contact with either physical or immaterial should be for glorifying our God in, in heaven Isaiah 40 4 through 5 every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken <laughs> Isaiah 42 8 I am the Lord that's my name I will not yield my glory to another or my praise to idols you hear what he's saying there this is all mine this is all for me do it right I'm God I'm not gonna give my glory to somebody else even you Dave <laughs> especially you Dave Isaiah 44, 23. Sing for joy, you heavens, for the Lord has done this. Shout aloud, you earth beneath. Burst into song, you mountains, you forests and all your trees. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob. He displays his glory in Israel. Isaiah 48, 9 through 11. For my own name's sake, I delay my wrath. For the sake of my praise, I hold it back from you so as not to destroy you completely see I have refined you though not as silver I have tested you in the furnace of affliction for my own sake for my own sake I do this how can I myself be defamed I will not yield my glory to another do you hear it this is only in the book of Isaiah Isaiah 49 3 you are my servant Israel in whom I will be glorified Isaiah 62 for behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you. One more, Isaiah 61, 1 through 3. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, to give them the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness. The planting of the Lord that he may be glorified. And all things. And you can say, well, he's only talking to Israel right there, so we're kind of left out of the equation. Maybe that makes it so we don't have to glorify God like his chosen people were supposed to glorify God. Do you think that's true sitting here today? Absolutely not. Because God has reached into the entire world to offer redemption to it and in redeeming of people they then in turn become part of what God intended for creation intended for humanity and those people turn around from their fallenness that's the repentance they quit looking at themselves as the center of all things the center of the universe and they turn to God in belief and in trust and in hope and repentance and follow him and glorify him and this is why God created the world that he may be glorified this does not mean that he may be made glorious okay that's different John Piper says don't take the word glory and treat it like the word beautify to beautify means to take a plain room and make it beautiful he says we don't take a plain God and make him beautiful that's not what glorifying God means so we don't glorify God by improving his glory but by seeing and savoring and showing his glory and when God created the world do you think he he needed to do it you think he was like oh you know things are okay right now but they'd be really good if that's not at all what happened God does not create anything out of any need or weakness or deficiency but instead he creates out of fullness and strength and being completely 
self-sufficient and self-sustaining. As Jonathan Edwards said, "'Tis no argument of the emptiness or deficiency of a fountain that it is inclined to overflow." Isn't that beautiful? Think there's something wrong with a fountain? Because it's full of water and it might have more water in it than it wants to contain? "'Tis no argument of the emptiness or deficiency of a fountain that it is inclined to overflow." So you have this fountain, you've seen the and it holds the water. Is there anything wrong with that if it shared the water with something else? There's nothing wrong with that. So we don't glorify God by improving upon the glory that it already has, but by seeing and showing his glory. This is why anything exists guys this is why the universe exists this is if this takes hold of you the way that it should it would affect you the way that you feel and you think about anything because now you know why everything exists and you don't like carry that around as like this badge of honor hey everybody I'm so wise I know like the summation of all things I know why all things exist is that glorifying God or self? <laughs> self? Yeah. Just let you know I know everything about everything. And we don't need to know everything. Because there's all kinds of things we don't know. There's billions or trillions of things that we don't know and can't know. But you are never at a loss to know something important about anything. Because you know that everything exists for the glory of God, and you know something about everything. And this is one of the most important things that you can know. And so to know this one thing, that all exists, everything exists for the glory of God, is to know something supremely important about everything, namely, for what purpose it ultimately exists for. And that is an amazing thing, isn't it? Rocks and trees birds why does, this, why does this exist what is that all about you know we just discovered this new species of something over here in this country yeah it's to the glory of God <laughs> that you found that that's to his glory oh we just discovered the furthest away star we've ever seen you know oh yeah 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 I figured I figured somebody would see that what's that for just to glorify God you have a response to the question about everything but you can't just leave it there because it's too general and it's too disconnected from the Godhead it's too disconnected from the, the the three persons of the Trinity and from the flow of history the way God is moving us through it so the question is just not why did God create the world but why this world <laughs> right why the way things are that the way that they are why did he create things in the way that he has you know, why these thousands of years of human history with a glorious beginning and a terrible fall in sin and a history of Israel and the coming of the Son of God into the world who was a substitutionary death and there was a triumphant resurrection there was the church and the history of the gospel spreading out into the whole world. Why this world? Why this history? And the short answer to that question is for the glory of God's presence in all things. For the glory of God's grace. For the glory of God displayed supremely in the death of Jesus. Or to say it a different way, this world, this history, is it's, it's seen, unfolded, was created, and is guided and sustained by God so that His grace displayed in the death and resurrection of Jesus for sinners would be glorified. And this would happen throughout all eternity for the, 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 the Christ 
believing, following, and trusting person for the joy that he set forth to redeem people. This world exists for the glory of God's grace revealed and then his rescuing of it through Jesus Christ. And this means when we hear about this, when we talk about all things pointing back to God and specifically in redemptive history to Jesus and his work on the cross, it means that we're not just like a God-centered church because nobody can really nail that down. What do you mean by God? Where, where did you get your understanding of God from? So it's not just that it's God-centered, but it's a Christ-centered, gospel-driven church. And for us, there is an unbreakable connection between the glory of God, the glory of the favor that he has shown, and the glory of Christ, and the glory of the cross, and all these things they fit together in order that every tongue will confess, right? Every knee will bow in our earth and under the earth that, that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so it's not enough just to walk out and be like, well, that's pretty. God must have made this. It's, where do I fit into the understanding of the everything? And we do well to continually point out how we stand before God and His glory without a Savior in Jesus Christ. That's a dangerous, scary place to be. But because of Him, we see the glory of God not only displayed in what He's made, but what He's remade. Amen? And have a word of prayer. We're going to close out with a, a song. And Brother Andrew's going to come up and close us out. But I want you to think on these things. When you do, do not take for granted that you are part of everything that God has made and that you bear His image so that you may reflect the glory of God to other people and that you can treat God's created order the way he intended us to do for his glory and you can look at other people who are also image bearers of God and you can say I'm going to not only reflect the image of God to them but I'm going to treat them as an image bearer of the God that we are to show glory to And so as we have this time of prayer, maybe this is time of newness, a time of the opening of the eyes and the eyes of the heart. And so let's pray. God, we thank you for today. Lord, if we're doing things that do not glorify you, Lord, we we are not only sorry, but God, give us the grace that we would turn away from these things that, that give us great lengths of travel from where you would desire to have us. Lord, if there are any ways in us that are dark and, 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 and we have not yet submitted them to you, Lord, help us to do that for your glory. Lord, if we're still dead in our sin, if we're sitting in this room and we have not confessed that we have sinned against an eternal God, Lord, I pray that you, you speak into the, the souls of those people. Give them the, the grace so that they can realize not only what they've done in their life, but what they've done to you and what you've done for them in the cross. And Lord, I just pray that as a, as a church, as a, as a body of believers,
And we have been continually called back to the, the weightiness of what you've made. And we would return to say, God, you're just so awesome and amazing and beautiful, and I'm not. Make me new. Make me like you wanted me to be so that I can show and shine and profess your glory to other people. And so I can worship you with my whole heart, mind, and soul and strength. Lord, we thank you for the atoning work on the cross. We thank you for Christ taking the, 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 the payment for our sin being the propitiation that what you took our sin and imputed it to him and you punished him and you you crushed him in our place and then Lord I thank you for us being able to be given that grace to be able to see salvation and and we put our hope and trust in that and then you give us the righteousness of Christ Lord thank you so much for that but oh Lord you're wonderful you're beautiful you deserve all the glory that we can muster for your sake. Lord, we love you today. And Lord, I pray that you would make us more like your son Christ every day. And I just pray these things in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said,